So, I'm going to talk about uh, censorship in comic books. And in order to do that, we have to travel back in time. And thanks to my friends, the Fantastic Four, we have Dr. Doom's time travel device which will take us back in time, all the way back. <laughs> Oops, that's a little too far back. <laughs> uh, but this is where freedom of speech starts with the, uh, in America with the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution. And you might be wondering just how old those faculty in the political science department on are. Um, it's good to be first, the first Avenger, there's the first Marvel comic book, first superhero, and the first female superhero. Um, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1789 reads, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. It's good to think about that as the First Amendment. There's a lot of talk always about the Second Amendment, but the First Amendment is about free speech. The Founding Fathers thought that was the most important thing, and that's where they started. Thomas Jefferson would like to have had it in the Constitution. There was debate about that. But we've got to go a little further into the future. There I was in 1602, and here I am in World War II with Bucky Barnes, uh, but that's still a little too far back. This is getting closer. When Captain America returns. And finally, in the year 1954, when Frederick, Frederick Wortham, <coughs> a psychologist, published the book Seduction of the Innocent. And this launched a kind of war on comic books. Te teachers had always thought they were trash and didn't want them in their classrooms. And kids would sometimes try to hide a comic book inside a textbook and be reading them because they're fun. Uh, parents would throw them out. My parents were threatening to throw them out all the time. Um, <clears throat> in fact, of course, comics are rarely taught in schools. You probably didn't get to have them in your school. Uh, maybe, sometimes now, there'll be one graphic novel used. So Seduction of the Innocent comes out in 1954. Um, one of the things that, uh, Wortham was worried about how comic books were damaging teenagers in America, the youth of America. He talked about all kinds of things, especially the notion of Batman and Robin as being more than a father's son figure, but some sort of homosexual couple. That comes from Wortham's idea. He was worried about graphic horror, the exploitation of women, which was often seen on the covers of comic books at that time, especially EC Comics. Um, and here, in a great quote, uh, Stan Lee, creative Spider-Man, and, and one of the, the founder, really, of Marvel Comics, Stan wrote that Wortham once claimed he did a survey that demonstrated that most of the kids in reform schools were comic book readers. And Stan said, if you do another study, you'll find that most of the kids who drink milk are comic book readers, so should we ban milk? Um, okay. <clears throat> but that book was so important and had such an effect on the public that Congress decided to hold hearings about the danger of comic books. They held those in 1954, um, and they created, or actually the comic industry then, as a reaction, created what was known as the Comics Code Authority. Um, and they would put this seal, here you can see, and this is my good friend Alex Romanoli holding his prized copy of Daredevil number one, which is probably worth $3,000 today. Um, big time stuff. Uh, there's the symbol approved by the Comics Code Authority. And so what was the effect of that? Now this was voluntary. Congress didn't pass a law to regulate comic books. The comic industry said, we'll regulate ourselves. We'll put our own uh, check system in. So one thing that happened is they were at the time publishing roughly 650 comics, and that dropped to about 250. A number of publishers eventually went out of business, including EC Comics. Um, so a number of them closed. So they weren't being censored by, by Congress, but there was a form of censorship going on. Uh, and the code had all kinds of rules about what you could do and what you couldn't do. Um, you had to treat people in authority respectfully. So you couldn't have a cop that was a drunk. You couldn't criticize the government or the police in a story. 
Um, you couldn't have excess violence, no sexual stuff. Um, love stories had to emphasize the sanctity of marriage um, and avoid stimulating the lower and baser emotions. Um, you also couldn't have any vampires, werewolves, or, or zombies, um, so we wouldn't have The Walking Dead now if that had stayed in existence. And in every instance, good shall triumph over evil. That was in the code, and there's the seal. Okay. So the comics, they, they tried to follow these rules, but over time there were some sort of challenges to them. EC Comics, before it went out of business, published a story in Incredible Science Fiction 33 about racial injustice. Um, and the sort of, uh, at the end, the hook, the surprising climax to the story was that when the astronaut took his helmet off, it turned out he was black. And actually, the head, um, Judge Murphy, refused. he said, well, you can't have a black character be the astronaut. That won't work. Now, the whole story was about racial intolerance. Um, and so he really obviously didn't read the story. Um, and so EC, EC threatened to make those comments known publicly. And so eventually, they backed off and, and did put the uh, seal of approval on that comic. But it was just one of the example of how ridiculous the code was and how it was enforced. Um, and, and some of the biases of the time period. Okay. Even more interestingly, in 1971, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare is worried about drugs, and they know that there are a lot of kids who read Spider-Man. And so they wrote to Stanley, who by then, he started as a writer, by now he's editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics, uh, and they said, hey, Stan, could you write a story that you warn kids about the dangers of drug addiction? Stan thought it was great. He writes a three-part story, three issues. Uh, Spider-Man 96, 97, and 98. And he says, you know, he didn't want it to be too preachy. He didn't think it would be the main part of the story. It still had to be action. Stan loves action, so it had to be an action Spider-Man story. Um, the drug stuff was kind of a side thing. A kid was up on top of a roof, and he was, Stan didn't even say what the drug was. He was just out of it and maybe going to commit suicide. Um, and so Spider-Man saves him. Um, and so Stan puts this in. It's clearly an anti-drug message. And here um, is Spider-Man thinking about that. He says, you know, my life as Spider-Man is probably as dangerous as any, but I'd rather face 100 supervillains than toss it away by getting hooked on hard drugs, because that's one fight you can't win. And then he talks about um, his, his editor, Peter Parker, is a uh, photojournalist, um, and that at the Daily Bugle, they write all these editorials and nobody listens, wish Spider-Man could do something. Very anti-drug message. Essentially, Spidey says, don't do drugs, kids. And that's good advice still today, so keep that in mind. <laughs> but this, the Comics Code Authority would not approve the story. They said, no, we can't approve it. Sorry, Stan, because you mentioned drugs in the story. And you're not allowed to mention drugs in the story. That's against the code. Stan said, well, wait a second, it's an anti-drug. We're not encouraging people to take drugs. We're telling them not to take drugs. They're like, nope, it talks about drugs. We can't approve it. Uh, <laughs> and so they had been doing the code for a while now. This is almost 20 years, I guess, roughly. Um, Stan, as editor-in-chief, says, you know, I think we need to run the story anyway. Not running it is going to cause more problems than if we run it. Um, and, you know, we, we have some responsibility. The federal government has actually asked us to run this story. So he went and talked to the, pub the owner, the publisher at that time, and they agreed that they would run it, although they, the publisher was a little nervous, but said, well, you know, we've never done this before. But they decided to publish the comic anyway without the code. And so if you look uh, here, you can see there's no A on this cover because the comics code had not, they wouldn't approve that story. It was published anyway. Now, first time that Marvel ever did that. Okay. Well, over time, eventually the code, and today you won't see an A on those comics because the code has sort of been phased out. It's really commercial interest that caused it, not uh, any, and although Stan's work actually helped kind of speed that along, what happens is the readership changes. I was a kid, I always collected comic books. I started when I was in uh, kindergarten, um, and so I read them, and I got older, and I kept reading them. In those days, you couldn't admit that you were a comic book reader, so I would sneak in, you know, and heaven forbid I would let any, you know, girl from my high school see me buying a comic book. That would have been terrible. Um, <laughs> you had to look cool. Now you can wear a superhero shirt and look cool. Um, well. 
<laughs> kind of. So at any rate, um, the code eventually gets dropped because we start having independent comic book publishers. A lot of the creators decided they could make more money working on their own. Todd McFarlane is the most famous. He comes up with Spawn. He's also the one who creates the, um, he does all this like webbing kinds of artwork um, that's really famous and sort of the black Spider-Man costume comes out of that. Um, and the market was just aging. We didn't have a lot of kids reading comic books now. It's a much older market. It's people like me who are still buying comics. We don't really need to have everything censored. Okay. But you might say, well, that was back in 1954. What did they know back then, right? They're, this is the modern times. You don't need to worry about censorship now. But interestingly, um, the American Library Association tracks censorship challenges to books. Um, often these challenges are either someone says, well, that book shouldn't be in my public library, and I pay taxes, so that should be taken out, or also it shouldn't be in this high school library, public school library. The most challenged books, and this is just, uh, this was from 2013, I got this data. So Bone, a fabulous graphic novel, no superheroes, is a wonderful story, great kind of cartoony artwork, fabulous, can't put it down. Um, that's been challenged a ton. The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie, one of the best young adult novels ever. He, the uh, main character does a lot of comic book drawing. It's all about racial issues. He's a Native American who's getting a poor education and then moves to a white school. Uh, and then the most popular book, Captain Underpants. Uh, my kids and my sons loved and read all of those. And the main characters, George Beard and Harold Hutchins, write their own comic book. Uh, super, super popular constantly challenged because it's sort of disrespectful. That's one of the challenges there. And I will say um, that uh, President Driscoll often reads that at our banned books event. Um, so stuff gets challenged. Um, and <coughs> Romanelli, Marie Romanelli, an IEP doctoral student, did a study looking at what she labeled this as kind of outsider literacy. So people who read comic books are sort of on the side of what we might consider mainstream literacy. Um, requires some other skills. It's kind of interesting because you have to, you know, often what happens in a comic story is you have, you see something and something happens outside the panel and then we come to the next panel. So it requires some different visual literacy skills. Um, she labeled that as outsider literacy. There's the first appearance of Black Panther. The other thing that happens kind of routinely is from an academic standpoint, people think, well, you know, that's just kid stuff. It's not important literacy. Comic books don't really matter. Um, Douglas Wolk, he's an artist, uh, talks about, well, you know, they're sort of always there, but they're not really important. Um, I, in my own book, Enter the Superheroes, talking about how it's always sort of looked down upon. Maybe you could have one graphic novel. I don't know if anyone, has anyone ever had a graphic novel used in a class? No. <laughs> so it shows that we're not treating them as literature, per se. They're sort of ghettoized, um, even though they persisted since the 1940s. Okay. In 1985, a book comes out called Watchmen. You might have heard of that. Um, it's one of the more famous comic books. And actually, in, in 2005, Time Magazine labeled this as one of the 100 best novels of all time. So it's on the list with War and Peace and um, The Great Gatsby and all that other stuff. Um, and that was kind of unique at the time to actually have a comic book or a graphic novel, which is just a collection of comic books, treated as an actual piece of literature, worthy of reading along with everything else. It's a masterpiece, wonderful book. Um, but that has also been challenged in a number of high schools. Um, there have been challenges against it, sometimes one, sometimes not. Um, one of the things it talks about is that the heroes are, in, it, it treats superheroes as if they lived in our world, in the real world. And what it says is, boy, they'd be very violent, they might be abusive, they're very flawed, they help the government keep control. Our political scientists might be interested that they help Nixon stay in power because we win the Vietnam War with their help. Um, yeah, and it's not good. Uh, we're lucky that he's not in power. <laughs> I think they get rid of term limits, too. Um, you have a character in the book called Rorschach who's sort of insane. Um, and he, his mask moves around like a Rorschach shadow, or a Rorschach test, psych psychological test. He's, he's very, his moral code, he's uncompromising. 
black and white, good or bad. If, you, if you're jaywalking, he might beat you up because you're breaking the law. That's kind of, he's out of, tune, out of touch, but sees everything in that way. He's very paranoid, he's super violent, but he is a writer, so that's a good thing. He keeps a journal. Um, and, and we use, uh, Rorschach helps us to see sort of what it's like to be a superhero, the way, you know, great power really corrupts. Um, it kind of drives him mad. Uh, and also some of the other heroes in the story get killed, including the comedian who dies at the beginning of the story. Um, also, there's a character in the book called Silk Spectre. And she is, uh, tries to resist sort of being labeled as a sex object. You can see the costume though, and she talks about why am I having to wear this costume. Um, she's very troubled, uh, she's self-critical of herself, super smart, good fighter. Um, and, and so she's meant to resist what are known as fanboy conventions. So the idea, most of the readership of comics was often male, and so you have a lot of you know, use of women just as sexual objects, um, and this is problematic. And so at one point she says, yeah, you know, how can I fight in this ridiculous costume? She's inherited the costume from her mother and the, the, the persona of the Silk Spectre. Um, there, there's some questions about rape and violence against women that the book tackles. Um, actually, Silk Spectre ends up having to be the one to argue for all of humanity to be saved. Um, I won't tell you what happens. Uh, the, it's only partially successful. I mean, on the one hand, she's sort of exploited because of the way she's drawn and the costume she wears. On the other hand, I think it does sort of critique all that. You certainly would say, it, you can see, having read it, you can see why Time Magazine thought it was such a great novel, great story, um, certainly worthy of being in the average library. And here's a great uh, quote from Alan Moore, who's the writer of Watchmen. If parents are making decisions that their children can or cannot read this sort of book in the home, that's fair enough, right? A parent can make that decision for their child. The parents can take the consequences. He also says, I won't necessarily stop the kid from reading the book, but at least it's a transaction between the child and the parent. And it's the parent taking responsibility for the children. All of that's fair. They shouldn't hand over that responsibility to an outside body, and along with it, hand over the responsibility of all those other parents who have been finding it quite easy to take an actual personal interest in what their children are reading and to monitor their reading habits. So he wrote this in response to one of the challenges. In other words, it's fine if I decide I don't want my sons to read it, but why should I make that decision for anyone else? Parents should get to have that choice. But if you take the book out of the library, the kids in that particular school won't be able to read it. So that's somewhat more recent, uh, recent censorship. But in case you think, well, that was still a little while ago, 1985. This is brand new, 2018. DC Comics launches this new line of comic books. Uh, call, they're calling it the Black Label line. And the idea was they take big time creators, um, Azzarello is a big time writer, um, big superheroes, Batman and others. You know, Batman, of course, is one of the lead characters for DC Comics. Um, and, and they would have some fr creative freedom. One of the things about comic books, you're normally locked into all the stories that came in the past. Superman's been around for se over 70 years now. We can't change the fact that Krypton blew up and he's the last son of Krypton. But here you might be able to mess with some of that stuff. So they print 115,000 copies of this along with a digital version. Um, and, and this is a great, uh, this is one reviewer. He says, the Batman horror series from acclaimed uh, artist Brian Azzarello and Lee Burma Burmajo aims to strip Batman naked of his larger-than-life persona to expose, expose the scared, vulnerable humanity underneath. Burma, Burma Joe is the artist. Burm, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Burma Joe uh, took that goal to heart. Here's the most controversial moment of the whole presentation. I don't know if you can see it. Barely. Oh, yeah. It's Batman, it's bat art? <laughs> If you can't see it, you can't see it. You'll have to Google it online. We're getting a full picture of Batman. Never before have we seen Batman naked in a DC comic book. You could go online and find you know, alternative drawings by fans, but, but not the real, real DC. So is it bat art? Or is it just a 
production error. <laughs> so here um, at Comic Con, New York Comic Con, I was at that um, this year, 2018. Um, DC Comic or Polygon, a, a kind of media, um, popular media outlet not online. They interviewed the publishers of DC Comics, Jim Lee and Dan Didio. And uh, so Jim Lee says, I think we made some choices after it went out. He said, and there were some production errors that led to the book uh, being published the way it was. Now, the, right, did the artist accidentally draw Batman's uh, male appendage? Um, <laughs> production errors. Thankfully, people were pleased with the story, the beautiful art, um, and so on. And I will say that, although I don't buy that for a minute, that there were production errors, Dan Didio's really cool and posed for me, uh, posed with me for a picture in 2013 when I was there. I bumped into him at the ferry. Um, so there he is. And if only I'd been wearing my IUP shirt that day. <laughs> okay. So how does DC respond? Of course, this creates controversy. If you Google Batman's penis, you'll find all kinds of stuff to talk about it. That becomes the story, and DC has to respond. They say, well, we got to rethink what we're doing with the Black Label line. Um, we wished it never would have happened that way because it's taking attention from the storytelling. Um, and what DC does, among other things, is they take the digital edition and they change the artwork. Okay? So here you can see, there's the redrawn artwork. Now it's just shadow, there's nothing to see. It's just Batman. They couldn't change the print copies. You can still get those if you go to your local comic book shop which I encourage you to do, but um, they changed the digital version. No bad gadget. Okay. And this does get a lot of critiquing, uh, a lot of discussion about it. Um, <clears throat> one writer says, you know, it's a great story. The idea is Batman's nudity is supposed to show how vulnerable he is, um, and, and so the nudity actually adds to the story. Um, but, of course, he says here at the end, art depicting human bodies in various states of undress, ranging from scantily clad to fully nude, is nothing new to comics. But apparently when it comes to showing male bodies in the buff, we've still got a ways to go. So you can show Silk Spectre wearing almost nothing, basically in lingerie, but we can't show Batman nude. That's still a problem. And actually, Polygon Comics editor Susan, uh, Susanna Paolo Talks about, well, how much is it already, even though he appears nude in the book, is it actually censored anyway? She says, look how black it is. You can barely see it. In fact, she says she got the comic, was really excited to read it, reads the whole story, and then had to go back through again to see where the nude picture was because she missed it. Because it's so, um, you know, it's, it's so subtle. Barely, we're still barely seeing him in the shadow, right? You had to kind of strain to see that picture. Um, I had to look a couple of times to figure out exactly what the controversy was. Um, so, Paolo says, look, actually back in Watchmen, we get to see male nudity in that book. Um, but this is Batman. This is the most famous, you know, Batman and Superman, the two most famous characters DC Comics owns, Wonder Woman being the third. Um, so this is Batman. This is a big time thing to have Batman be nude. She said you can go anywhere online and find it, but this is an official comic book coming from the publisher. And she said, "Is if you're going to do that, you have some responsibility to, to be bold about it. What, you know, it should be part of the story. There should be a reason for doing it. It should make sense. Uh, and she says, really, they're basically, you know, they did it, but it's kind of like trying to hide it. And, you know, and maybe they did it so they would get past the editors, which apparently they did. Um, and she says the same thing. Can you believe this is what we're talking about? <laughs> okay. So I think what's interesting from a free speech perspective is that although we live in the United States and we have freedom of speech, our freedom of speech is also constrained in various ways, right? Nobody said, you know, and in fact, um, let me just go back for one moment. So Paolo, Susanna says, look, the, the black line, the whole idea is it's for mature readers. It's not for kids. This is not aimed at a 10-year-old audience. We have uh, Superhero Squad for that. This is aimed for adult readers. It's supposed to be more mature themes. There's all kinds of dark stuff in there. The Joker's been killed. Um, all kinds of stuff with Harley Quinn. 
And she's saying, so, you know, if that's the target audience, then how come we can't have, you know, regular, why would nudity be such a problem? You're already marketing to a more adult audience. Um, I think if we think about how freedom of speech works, it's interesting, for instance, that it's 2018, as, as much as people will say, well, everything, you know, anything goes, you can see anything online. In the comics world, actually stuff is very regulated. We don't have, there is a, you know, a sex scene in the Watchmen movie. You won't see that in the Avengers movies. Um, all the Marvel movies, we have 20 now. They're, you know, they'll kiss, but we don't have any, like, even vague looking like sex scenes. Um, so stuff is censored for us because somebody out there thinks, well, they, you know, it's not okay. Or maybe there's worry about kids. I think movies, yeah, it's a big audience, so we're going to have children. D Disney owns that, so Disney imposes its own set of standards. You don't get a lot of swearing in the Marvel movies, because, you know, other than Deadpool, but that's a Sony product. Um, there are also always people interested in controlling our speech, and we need, really need to think about that. Sometimes even the stories we might get to read as, you know, an adult consumer of comic books, I ought to be able to read a story about Batman as an adult. Um, but it's 2018. You'd think somebody would have already done a story like that. There have been hundreds of thousands of Batman comic books. Tyranny loves silence. So regularly our politicians like to complain about the press. And especially if we're investigating things they might have done wrong, well, they don't want to hear that. They don't want the press to report about that. It's better to keep people silent. Don't talk about it. Don't have it in the press. That's how uh, tyranny works. So we have some responsibility then as consumers of information, whether it's comic books or news or anything else. We need to be critical about the information we get. Think about who's telling it and who doesn't want us to know certain things or who, who's backing that, who pays for the information that we get, where does it come from. If Disney is, you know, funding the Marvel movies, what, you know, they are interested in selling products always to people like me. Um, we need to check facts and sources. Politicians will make all kinds of claims. All, on either side of the, of the political spectrum, they lie all the time. They just make stuff up. It's up to us to check on that, look for the real facts, and decide what's accurate. And that should really inform our votes. And in fact, I read a recent editorial in terms of health care. People were saying, what, so this will, this will affect lots of us, certainly your parents, if not you. Um, the, in the Obamacare package, the um, previously existing conditions, so under that legislation, if you have a prior condition, you can still get health care. That has been regularly attacked, and there are people campaigning this year saying, oh, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to take that right away, who actually voted to take it away last year. If you check the facts, you can find that out. Um, so you need to check and see, because often they might say one thing and vote another way. It's the voting record that actually matters need to get informed about all these kinds of issues, and most importantly, you need to vote. So uh, November 6th is the election. Certainly want to encourage you to exercise your right. Um, and if you're from another country, vote in your home country elections. Don't let that go. It's important no matter where you're from. Hopefully, you have the right to vote if you're from another country. Not everybody has the right that we have. We ought to exercise that right. We had to fight for that. Okay. Some other ways to get involved. Every year, uh, IUP holds a banned book event. That's uh, usually in October. This year, the library ran. So you're too late for this year, but you can take part next year. Um, one of the things we do is a banned book readout. And so you can pick from your favorite challenged book and read, read part of it. And almost any good book you've ever heard of has been challenged. Shakespeare, the Koran, Dracula, Twilight, the Bible. It's all been challenged somewhere. So you're, you might want to pick your favorite book, see if it's ever been challenged, and read from it. Okay. There's also a Comic Book League Defense Fund. So this organization supports comic book companies or artists who've been challenged, who've had their books challenged. They provide support for that. Um, and they're a nonprofit organization that you could contribute to. They also put out some cool, here's the character, here's this bone. Cool, cool little figure. 
He likes to quote from Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, it's similar, similar art. Okay. I've done a little scholarship on comic books. And I thought I might finish with this thought for you. What makes superhero stories the most important are their effects on people, on how people perceive right and wrong, justice and injustice, power and humility, um, and the world, both real and imagined. Almost anything that you can imagine happening in society has been covered in comic books in some fashion. So they're a great tool. Some of you who will go on to be teachers or are already teachers may be interested. There's tons of great, and in, in my book we talk about a whole canon of excellent books that you could use to cover a wide variety of issues. How am I doing on time? Yeah, not too bad. Okay. There I am with the shield. Stan Lee would always say, enough said. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, questions? Comments? First of all, thank you. <laughs> I'll ask the question. Yes. One of my early memories with respect to comic books was uh, encountering classic comics. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So the first time I read Bret Hart's story, The Luck of Roaring Camp, I read it as a classic comic. Is that, was, was, was the advent of the classic comic a, a kind of reaction of the comic book industry against this charge that they were somehow Yeah, it, ca it, 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 it came comic. out, and I mean, it was, a, it, it was partly a way to get people to see comic books as a valid form of literature, so that it was kind of, and often, Arguments will be made that comics are kind of a bridge literature. So, like, you, and in fact, my own father, who is an English retired English professor now, um, he said, "Well, if you're going to read comics, why don't you read these Greek myths? Because those guys are, you know, Hercules is just a superhero, um, and so he w was interested in using it as a bridge to other kinds of literacy. In fact, that's one of the things that studies have shown that if you read comic books as a kid." it led towards other kinds of literacy. So they were actually a good thing um, to promote kids, kids to be interested in reading. The same, you know, I think a, another change is that at that time, we didn't have a young adult book market the way we do now. So now we have more books targeted to a whole, you know, there's a middle, middle grade books, there's young books, um, the Magic Treehouse series, there's all kinds of stuff really age targeted Publishers are smarter about saying, well, what would appeal to this kind of kid versus, you know, at that time when we have Wortham's book come out, comics are the main thing that kids could read that, you know, they're not reading novels at that point because they were too, too advanced in some ways. Um, so, yeah, the, so the Classics Illustrated series did a lot of just, you know, it was a way to, and, and sometimes teachers would have used those or at least said, well, that's okay because it's a, it's a great story. It's illustrated, but it's a great story. Um, and actually, the publisher, they did a little bit of redoing some of those things later in the 70s. They re reintroduced some of those stories and did another line kind of like that. So there, I think there's always been some interest in that. Um, I think also there are some graphic novels that get taught in schools. Watchmen is one, but also Persepolis you might have heard of, um, which is about an Iranian uh, girl. And then also Mouse is the most famous graphic novel. Um, Mouse is about um, uh, Jews in World War II, only the Jews are mice and the pigs are the Nazis and the cats are Nazis. I think the pigs are Gestapo and the cats are the Nazis. Um, one of the interesting things about Mouse, so it's a graphic novel, basically just a life story about, the, it talks about concentration camps and hiding people in the attic and all kinds of stuff that we know from other uh, narratives of, Hol of the Holocaust. Um, so Mouse, when it came out, it won the Pulitzer Prize, which is the most prestigious award in, award in the U.S. For, for literature. Mouse wins that. Then the Pulitzer uh, Committee changed the rules to say that a graphic novel could never again win the award. Um, so they didn't, they didn't feel they wanted to have to compete with that. I suppose because you have visuals as well as a story at work there. Um, and Mouse is interesting because even though it's a graphic, he doesn't really do much. Like, he never does anything with the fact of them being mice other than they're sort of 
mice who are stomped on, essentially. But the con it, it doesn't, you know, there's nothing fantastical about the story. It's still sort of slice of life. They could be drawings of regular people rather than mice, and you'd still get the effect. Uh, but yeah, that was the reaction to make, um, to change the award structure so that you couldn't have another graphic novel one. Also, uh, along that vein, if you think about awards, which is a way of recognizing literature that matters, um, the, the Academy Awards just this year announced that they're going to do a kind of blockbuster category, or I, I forget what it's called. It, um, so they've been criticized because none of the superhero films ever get nominated. Wonder Woman was left out. This year, Black Panther, which re received a lot of critical acclaim, really probably ought to be nominated for Best Picture, but they just made this new category, which will handle kind of adventure movies and all that stuff. So I'm sure Black Panther will win in that category. Um, the Dark Knight, which was sort of the most acclaimed uh, superhero film previously, um, Heath Ledger, who died during the making of the film, played Joker and did win Best Actor, uh, but, the, but the Dark Knight itself, the movie, didn't get nominated for Best Picture. Um, so again, it's sort of, there's acceptance and not acceptance. They begrudgingly, they'll bring the actors in to give out an award, but they won't nominate the films. Or they get, they get technical awards, you know, best special effects, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's interesting. Again, so it's, as far as what we consider good or great literature, what's, what's a great movie, what's just a, you know, a fun movie, um, certainly they deal with all kinds of issues. Yes? <laughs> It's still primarily a male readership, um, and it would skew, it skews more heavily older now. It's, it's more, I guess, adults as opposed to kids. In fact, that's been a concern for the comic book industry. So for decades, you could say that men have been filling the top race. Um, <laughs> uh, arguably, you know, um, sexualizing women. Yeah. Yeah. But again, the images that you put up, I mean, the legs are still in my mind. <laughs> the legs are still in my mind, and yet I couldn't see his penis at all. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to go online for that. <laughs> you know, the history of the text of the comics are completely separate. Right, right. I think, so in, in my book, we talk, we talk about what we call the hypersexualization of the characters. So the women are always, you know, they're big breasted, they're usually in very skimpy outfits, it's definitely exploitation. Um, the men are also, they're all drawn super buff, right? They're, they're great big muscles, they're lean, they look perfect. They're not drawn, you know, they're, they're, they have full outfits, they're not exposed in that way, but they're not real people. They definitely look, they're sexualized in a slightly different way. Uh, we talk about that as a problem. Um, I think it's very, pro I mean, it's, it remains very problematic. So Wonder Woman, years and years of talking about we should have a Wonder Woman movie and nobody would ever make it. There was a failed pilot on TV. Um, which was written by the, uh, the writer of Ally McBeal, a highly successful female show. <coughs> Sounded like it'd be a great pilot to have him write Wonder Woman. Um, it's some interesting stuff about why that failed, but um, they kept saying, well, it won't work, it won't work. You know? And then finally, Wonder Woman comes out. It's a marvel, it's one of the best, it's by far the best DC film. Um, it's a wonderful film, you know, great. She's, She's powerful, you know, she, and they, they do things to invert the male gaze. So she's looking at um, Steve, uh, I forget his last name. Um, well, Steve, Steve Rogers and Steve, uh, Steve Austin, I think, is, is her lover. Um, what? Frederick. Steve Frederick, yeah. But isn't it Steve Austin in the comics? Yeah, Steve Austin is Bionic Man. I was thinking of Bionic Man. But it's always Steve Frederick. I, Steve Trevor. But did they change it in the movie, or was Steve Trevor? Okay, Steve Trevor, you are absolutely, bonus points for that student. <laughs> so yes, Steve Trevor, she's looking at him, and he's naked in the, in the scene in the film. Um, so there is a little bit of, you know, and they're playing around with that. It's a female director. It's, a, you know, great, great for that. Took them forever to decide to do that film, 
partly because all the other films are so bad, I think they finally decided we should try something else. Um, and now Marvel, like we have in the Avengers, the Black Widow, who's a fabulous character. And Scarlett Johansson's a marvelous actress. She's done some other movies where she's the lead, um, and yet they won't, you know, they, they had kept on saying, well, we can't do a Black Widow movie. Can't do a Black Widow movie. Finally, now they've decided after Wonder Woman was a success, maybe they would do a Black Widow movie. Um, and uh, by that same token, now we're going to have a Harley Quinn movie, the Joker's love interest. Um, so there's, it's, you know, we're talking 2018 that we're, I guess Wonder Woman was last year. 20, 2017, we finally get a primary female superhero. There was, there was a Supergirl movie and Elektra and Catwoman, all disastrously bad movies, and which really didn't sort of understand the characters and kind of exploited them. Um, Marvel now is going to do Captain Marvel, which is a fe they're the first female. So it looks really good. I'm hoping it's great. They make good movies. They know what they're doing. So let's hope it's really fantastic. Um, but I think, yeah, because of the male readership, you still have a skewing of the imagery is still really problematic. And the poses, you know, women are always like looking at it. We're looking at them from behind. Men are always posed, you know, big with a shield. Yes, fine. Yes, Comics Code Authority. And then you were talking about the more recent um, changes, but those were were motivated by sales. I sales, think? yeah, commercial and, interests. I mean, in your mind, what's the? Is there a critical difference between when the government is the censor versus the public, in a sense? I, I mean, I think definitely. I think what happens is that the sales notions, they probably, it's as, it's as bad censorship as when the government's doing it. Uh, in some ways, the, well, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, I think it's kind of interesting. So one of the things that happened was you used to be able to buy comics at the local grocery store or the local drug store. Um, over time, they quit selling them there and they opened independent comic shops. There is one in Indiana comics and sports uh, out by Martins and Three Amigos. So you can buy comics there. Um, so you had to go to a, a comic specialty shop so you could get the comics there. That, I think that was one reason they said, well, we, we don't need the code now because little kids aren't buying these. It is, you know, it's, it's adults who are buying them. They are, they're going with their parents. With their parent, yeah. You can't just walk to the store and buy it yourself. Plus the price went up. So it used to be 10 cents a quarter. Now we're talking four bucks for a comic, so you got to have money. Kids do have more money now, but um, they're just playing video games mostly. Um, so uh, uh, let me get to you, but I'll just sort of finish. I think in some ways it's about social norms which, which control right. things for us. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, in some ways, I mean, although that might be unfortunate, at least it's not like a power, it's somebody with a monopoly on coercion doing it. Right, right. I think you can have stuff in comics now that you maybe can't have on the screen with those characters. So there's still a sense, well, Superman, Batman, Captain America, they're, they're, kids are going to watch that, so we better not have too much swearing, can't have any nudity. You know, th so there's censorship that's happening. Um, and you, know, you can go to Deadpool, but Deadpool's rated R. That's the, one of the few that works that way. Yeah, question. So Batman Dan came out, and the, the next week, Invincible. Yes. Right. Do you think the difference there is just with it being Batman? I, I think, yeah, I think it's very much because it was Batman. I think also Watchmen, because they had a, an established con, uh, you know, continuity, the, and it was seen as a more adult kind of story. Right, right. And they're not, yeah, which is, so it's interesting. Yeah, the same two things. I think it's very much because it's Batman and because it created a lot of press. If no one had noticed, they probably would have said, oh, it's fine. It's just the black label. But as soon as people caught it, and you know, then they're having to backpedal and do this, well, production errors kind of issue. Well, let me get these questions that come. Yeah, yeah. I might have to turn to my political. I think because they're, they're only interested in getting people to vote for them to get into office, and so they can say almost anything. It's difficult. We, we vote for the ones who tell us the best lies. 
Right, right, yeah. I think there's a lot of simple, simple facts that could be checked. Um, and, they, you know, and in fact, we, sometimes they are challenged and they'll continue to keep saying the same lie. Um, they'll just do it at the next rally, you know, and if people are cheering when they hear it, that, you know, that, that's what works. Um, from my perspective, political sign is a sign. Right. And it must, it, it should not be biased or meant to, or meant to. So, but I don't know. So, <laughs> because I'm, this is a kind of global norm. Yeah. Even, even in my country, politicians almost always lie to the people. Right, right. And again, yeah, the people follow it. Mm-hmm. I think, I think even, especially in the United States, because, and I don't know statistics for, statistics for the rest of the world, the voter turnout is so low, if you took all the people who voted, who didn't vote, is still more than all the people who voted for both Trump and Clinton in that election. So partly what politicians learn is, I, I don't have to worry about everyone, I just have to worry about the people who are going to vote for me, and I need to fire them up, and so if a lie will get more people to respond, to fire, and, and I think they do it on both sides. I, you know, I mean, I guess to be a little bit fair, they're, they're often speaking off the cuff, they're, you know, they're rambling, uh, but then a lot of it's prepared too, it depends. And well, <laughs> I think we have, to, we have to decide what we mean by the word lie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is it a lie to, te- to tell only so much of the truth and leave another significant piece of the truth unspoken? So it's true up to this point, but there's another piece that, that, that calls into question the thing that's, so very often it's not overt lying, telling you an untruth. It's telling you only so much of the truth and stopping short of what we might call the full truth. Right, yeah. Although, that's more of the standard Yeah, standards have also. Well, after 2016, all bets are <laughs> off, yeah, right. Uh, Mr. Trevor back there. <laughs> in, in thinking about the win, do you think that like going about it in the past or five years is just a lot of variable or controversy? That that's a very interesting question. Yes. I, I, I wonder about that. I mean I only heard about it because in fact I had agreed to do the talk, but I hadn't heard about all this controversy until I got out to Comic Con and you know, people were talking about it. Um, I think that's certainly possible. You know, they're 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 it it certainly made me think, well, I got to go out and get that issue, right? I, and I have to have the print version. I got to have the, the, the official one. Um, so I think there's some talk about that. Um, I, although they were debating whether they were going to cancel the series, but I think it's still ongoing now, right? At least the second and third issue are out. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's... Um, I, I actually, in doing research for the presentation, was trying to find commentary from the artist or the writer. There isn't any, uh, at least I couldn't find it, like what them saying, well, what they were after, like what, why was it drawn, what were they trying to accomplish? So I wondered if they were not allowed to talk, and I think, you know, Didio and Lee are controlling the message. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think another interesting thing and I know this more on the Marvel side, Marvel actually isn't all that interested in the comics themselves. What they're interested in is, is the licensing of the characters. So in fact, like if we look at the problem of digital piracy, so you can go online and download comics illegally, just like you can download music illegally. Uh, the music industry really tried to crack down on that. Marvel, was, one of the executives was even asked, you know, is this a problem, illegal downloading of comics? And they're like, well, you know, you shouldn't do it, but we're, they were really not that worried about it because if you're reading Spider-Man, you're going to go see the movie. You're probably going to buy a t-shirt. Um, so they're much more interested in the characters. And so I wouldn't be surprised if DC is, you know, uh, whether they can, it, it, it's hard to know whether they would go that far to say, hey, let's do this and let it be a controversy. I, you can't believe it was a production error. Obviously, they knew that that drawing was in there because you know, who, the editor would have said, oh, I better check with my boss to see if this is okay if we let it go out. I, I can't well, imagine. I didn't know this either because I didn't notice. It's pretty hard to see, right? I didn't see it. Yeah. When you're talking about it afterwards, I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, there are except pictures online where you can see it circled in red if you really. <laughs> except that once you see it, you can't then not. Right, yeah. That, then, you, then you know it's there. So, yeah, I, um, 
I think it, you know, it certainly got people talking about that comic. And I think it does, 115,000 copies is a lot of copies to sell. So, um, I, you know, and there are a lot of Batman books out there. So, did you buy it, I guess is a question? <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> How much did you flip it for? Uh, $50. Nice. Uh, See? And <laughs> well, there you go. That, that in itself is worthwhile. Uh, other questions? You had another question, Glenn? Sure. Yeah. Um, anything else? All right. So uh, I guess if I'm going to wrap up this talk. Oh, here's how I got to do it. Pleased to be here. Signing off, Captain America. Thank you. <laughs>